Alhamdulillah wa kafa Wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi Alladhin astafa Khususan ala afdalihim Wa khatamin nabiyin Muhammadin al-amin Wa ala alihi Wa sahbihi ajma'in Wa ba'd We begin with Allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam brother adam ibrahim uh, secretary general of the research an information institute on Islam here in Tamantun Dr. Ismail in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh we meet at a very dangerous moment in our history and in the history of the world to address you on the subject of implications of a Zionist Israeli attack on Iran which now appears to be not only fairly certain but also just around the corner. In the process of uh, offering an explanation of the implications of such an attack, I would have to take recourse to Islamic eschatology to locate the implications of that attack in the larger framework of Islam's conception of Akhir zaman because I am convinced that it is located precisely in that subject. In the process also of offering my analysis, I will have to offer opinions of mine. If a politician and a prime minister and a government official, and a businessman, and a carpenter, and a taxi driver can offer opinions. Why can't a scholar of Islam do the same thing? What's wrong with that? Provided, of course, that we recognize that only Allah does not make mistakes. Number one. And number two, in my instance, in my instance, I always insist that when I offer my opinion or my view on any subject I insist that my audience should never accept my view unless and until you are convinced that it is correct if you can offer me anything better than that please tell me I think I've reached the limit so I should be allowed to offer my opinion and my views. I'm not a prophet. I don't have an angel or a jinn whispering into my ears. I'm offering you opinions based on analysis. And I have the right to do so. And those who warn people don't listen to Imran Hussein should be ashamed of themselves. Having said that, we say that Israel wants to attack Iran because Israel ultimately wants to rule the world. Because the Zionists want to rule the world. Because the Judeo-Christian Zionist European Alliance wants to deliver to the state of Israel the status of ruling state in the world. That's why we believe all these wars are taking place. 
Well, why does Israel want to rule the world? They said some 50, 60 years ago, and even then they were telling monstrous lies. So 9-11 was not the first lie. <laughs> they said that all that we want to do is to create a Jewish homeland in the Holy Land where Jews can live in safety and security. That's all we want to do. And we say that was a monstrous lie. What you wanted to do was to establish a Zionist state in the Holy Land which would seek to impersonate Holy Israel. The Israel, the Holy State of Israel that was established by Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, the Prophet David and Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam, the Prophet Solomon and that this Zionist State of Israel would one day rule the world that's what you wanted to do and you want Israel to rule the world so that one day not too long from now incidentally a man would stand up in Israel Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam described that man to us 1400 years ago or more so if you are listening in Washington tonight let's tell you what the Prophet said and if you're listening in London and in Jerusalem tonight let's tell you what Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said he said that that man would be a Jew he would be a young man and so the end of history will witness young people taking over the world <laughs> he would be a powerfully built man he would have curly hair and he would declare and he would declare I am the Messiah but that would be a lie the Messiah is the son of Mary sorry more than that he was the son of the Virgin Mary there's only one virgin in the world who ever gave birth to a son and still remain a virgin and that was Jesus Nabi Isa alayhi salam he is the Messiah Muslims believe that and most Christians believe that I don't know whether the Zionist Christians also believe that somebody should ask them he is the Messiah and one day he's coming back said Nabi Muhammad whether Washington believes that or not is irrelevant one day he's going to come back said Nabi Muhammad and when he comes back he's going to rule the world from Jerusalem that is in the hadith because he would be Hakimul Adil a ruler who will rule on the basis of justice those who today rule the world do so with injustice that's why they want this Israel to rule the world because that man who says I am the Messiah would not be the son of the Virgin Mary no said Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam he would be al-Masih al-Dajjal the false messiah the antichrist every Muslim knows about him most Christians know about him I don't know about the Zionist Christians and so lots of people know this subject and that moment when that man is going to rule the world from Jerusalem appears to me to be around the corner maybe 20 years maybe 30 years 
And so this is why they want to attack Iran. We want to begin our analysis tonight by pointing out that there is a moral foundation to the law of war and peace. And that moral foundation is that you do not launch wars unless there is a just cause for it. Iran has not done anything. Iran has not attacked Israel. Iran has not launched any missiles on Israel. Iran is not waging war on Israel. And so in accordance with your Israeli law of war, which has an immoral foundation, no morality attached to it, you have the right to wage war against the people unjustly. And so an attack on Iran would be unjust war. It would be an act of zulm in using the language of the Quran. An act of wickedness. Those who launch the attack would be a people who are committing monstrous sin. But I want to say something more. To those who are beating the drums of war in the Arab world and who are looking forward to the attack on Iran, that you are beating the drums of unjust war. And when the attack takes place, you will be committing the same sin as supporters of the war, as those who are themselves perpetrating the war. And shame on you! Shame on you, we say to you, straight to your faces, from here in Malaysia, that if you support the attack on Iran, you are supporting unjust war. You are yourselves a party of zulm. And Allah does not provide guidance to the people who commit zulm. One of the reasons why many Arabs, not all Arabs, not at all, but many Arabs are beating the drums of war, looking forward to an attack on Iran, is because Iran is Shia. They hold the view that Shia are kuffar. And hence it is permissible to launch war on the kuffar. The disbelievers. How can you come to this conclusion, the Shia a kuffar? If the Shia a kuffar, then there must be some ijma'ah or consensus of opinion on that subject. That consensus has never been achieved in 1400 years. Why? How can we say so? Here is proof. This is not the only proof, but this is adequate. The no regime in control of the Hejaz, in control of the Hajj, in our history that we know of, has ever prevented the Shia from performing the Hajj. As a consequence, we say, it is too late in the day now for you to come with any manufactured arguments declaring the Shia to be kuffar. Yes, we agree that it is an act of profound misguidance to declare that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a usurper and that Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a usurper. 
and Al Uthman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a usurper. Three of the foremost companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. It's a massive vote of no confidence in the Prophet himself alayhi salatu was salam. And we say of those who insist that these three companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam were usurpers, we say you are profoundly misguided. But we never say that you are not Muslims. You are still our Muslim brothers. And so the argument that the Shia are kuffar and hence it is permissible to launch war on them is invalid. But secondly, does the religion of Islam say it is permissible to wage war on kuffar? Where did you learn your Islam from? Mars or Venus or Jupiter? Huh? This is the religion of Islam. Truth is from your Lord. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whosoever wishes is free to accept and whosoever wishes is free to reject kufr. لا إكراه في الدين says the Quran there is no compulsion in matters of religion and so you are not permitted in Islam to wage war against any people because they are kuffar no there is a version of Islam today which has emerged in the world which seems to have originated in Saudi Arabia with Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab it used to be called Wahhabi, it's now called Salafi, and I have students of mine who are Salafi, and they are my students, which can best be described as a Protestant version of Islam. Protestantism in the modern world is a conception of religion which reduces religion to texts. And which interprets texts literally. As a consequence, Protestant Islam is incapable of distinguishing between appearance and reality, particularly when they differ with each other. But let's leave that fairly technical subject for a while. It is Protestant Islam today which is beating the drums against the Shia. Muslims who are Sunni and Muslims who are Shia have lived together for 1400 years peacefully, amicably without any boxing gloves, fighting with each other, without any bloodletting. And it is strange that at a time when the Zionists are about <laughs> to move to their final stage of the mission, there should come this strange drum beating from that version of Islam with great hostility to the Shia and paving the way for promoting war against the Shia. They call it a jihad against the Shia. They would like to force the Shia to abandon their Shia beliefs and to become Sunni. <laughs> do you do it by warfare? Actually, although they themselves may not understand it, the drum beating against the Shia and the attack which is about to be launched on Iran is located in a larger framework in which those who are waging war on Islam are seeking are seeking to do something that will function as a catalyst for creating Sunni Shia civil war in the world of Islam. 
Sunni Shia civil war would be something that would be massively beneficial for Israel. Number one, Sunni Shia civil war will make Islam look negatively, a negative image in the world. At a moment when Islam is center stage in the attention of the whole world. Number two, Sunni Shia civil war in Islam, Sunni versus Shia, would function as a diversion, diverting attention, both Muslim and non both Muslim and non-Muslim attention away from the plans of the Zionists to rule the world. Thirdly, Muslims fighting against themselves will obviously lead to a loss of power. Our power will decrease and that will be strategically advantageous for Israel. But most important of all, if an attack on Iran provokes Sunnis to be so foolish as to turn in hatred against the Shia and provokes Shia to be equally foolish to turn in hatred against the Sunni, then that Sunni Shia civil war, and I hope none in our audience here tonight is so stupid, it will allow that Sunni Shia civil war to destabilize very important parts of the world of Islam where there are significant Shia communities living amongst the Sunnis. Before we turn to identifying those areas which can be destabilized and advantages for Israel, let us conclude this section by asking how should Sunni Muslims around the world, who I hope would listen to this lecture, how should Sunni Muslims respond to an unjust Israeli and NATO attack on Iran? Number one, Sunni Muslims must follow the guidance of the Quran and the guidance which has come from Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam and not follow CNN and Al Jazeera. And you must support the victim of aggression. Even if the victim of aggression is not your friend. In this case, he's your Muslim brother. You must support the victim of aggression. And you must condemn the aggressor. That is the first response. Iran will be a victim of aggression and Israel will be an aggressor. How should Pakistan respond if Israel attacks Iran? And I hope the Pakistani people are listening. How should Egypt respond if Israel attacks Iran? Pakistani Muslims and Egyptian Muslims must ensure that they, the people, don't wait on the governments and don't wait on the armed forces. The people must respond by showing massive popular support for Iran as a victim of aggression and must clearly condemn not only those who wage war on Iran but also those who support those who are waging war on Iran with particular reference to the government of Saudi Arabia. Number two. So we have 
dealt briefly with the Sunni Shia civil war problem. War on Iran, and my gosh, look how much time has gone. War on Iran obviously is going to impact on the world economy. Number one, on the price of oil. Not only because Iran is a major supplier of oil, but also because Iran is located in that basin that the Iranians call the Persian Gulf and the Arabs call the Arab Gulf and they're still fighting over the words. Mm -hmm. This is the oil basin and the river Euphrates enters into this basin and Nabi Muhammad told us 1400 years ago that the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. I suggest that you don't wait for the metal. I want to suggest to you that this is not a text to be understood literally. Protestant Islam is going to wait for a mountain of the metal. Let them wait and we're not speaking disrespectfully of Protestant Islam. No, we're not speaking disrespectfully of the Salafis. Let me repeat it. I am not speaking disrespectfully of the Salafis and I'm not speaking disrespectfully of their methodology of a literal interpretation of the text. All I'm saying is let them wait for the mountain of the metal. We interpret the text differently and we say that mountain of gold is already here and it's black gold and it's oil. And the prophet prophesied that they're going to fight over it. And in the end, 99 out of every 100 are going to be killed. Conventional, war, conventional wars don't kill 99 out of every 100. Conventional wars do not kill 99% of all combatants. This has to be nuclear war to kill 99% of all combatants. Okay? So the Persian Gulf or the Arab Gulf is waiting for nuclear attacks. The price of oil is going to shoot up because Iran can also block the Straits of Hormuz. It's in our Iranian territory on this side and Oman on that side. It's not difficult for Iran to block the Straits of Hormuz and disrupt all the passage of oil tankers. So we can anticipate fairly confidently that the price of oil is going to escalate dramatically once the attack takes place. And the American government knows that. And that's why the American government does not want Iran to be attacked. Because the American government knows and the Federal Reserve knows and the bankers also know <laughs> that the US dollar is going to collapse. It will not survive an Israeli attack on Iran with the price of oil shooting up through the roof. And if the US dollar collapses, of course, they're going to have to demonetize the US dollar. It will no longer be legal tender. They have to have something in place. They probably already have something to replace it. But at a fraction of its previous value, the American economy is going to collapse. Large numbers of white Americans are going to lose their wealth. And many of them are going to be listening to this lecture. There's going to be chaos in the United States when the economy collapses. There can be riots in the United States and they're already anticipating that. And so an attack on Iran would lead to economic, financial and monetary consequences. There will be disastrous for the U.S. economy. Iran wants to become the new, uh, sorry, Israel wants to become the new ruling state in the world. And for that you have to go to my book. Would someone kindly give me a copy of Jerusalem in the Quran? You have to my, go to my book Jerusalem in the Quran for the Islamic eschatology. The Dajjal, when he's released, 
on earth will live for 40 days the prophet said one day like a year one day like a month one day like a week and all the rest of his days like your days we said a day like a like a year and Britain became the ruling state in the world and the world experienced what they call Pax Britannica it wasn't Pax at all it was only war and then came a day like a month over here and the United States of America replaced Britain as the next ruling state in the world and Pax Britannica was replaced with Pax Americana and the British sterling pound was replaced by the US dollar and we said this is our opinion that a day like a year came to an end and was replaced by a day like a month this is the first time the first time in our history that this hadith was interpreted this way and now we are saying that a day like a month is coming to an end and a day like a week is commencing and so there has to be a passage from the United States to a third ruling state and ten years ago when this book was published we said the third ruling state is Israel Israel wants to become the third ruling state for Israel to become the third ruling state the United States has to collapse and so this is going to be the collapse of the economy not just the US economy but more than that with the dramatic rise in the price of oil you're going to have a significant rise in the cost of living around the world transportation costs are going to escalate food prices are going to escalate energy prices will rise and this is also going to affect the prices of manufactured goods the poor of the world will sink as soon as Israel attacks Iran into greater poverty and in some cases destitution in Yemen now they can't afford to buy the cooking gas with which to cook the middle class around the world will sink into poverty and when there are so many poor the majority of mankind in poverty it's going to be easier it is going to be easier to rule the world but people who are too poor to organize themselves to resist oppression and resist slavery how should we respond to this impending economic collapse financial and monetary collapse how should we respond to the imminent rise of the cost of living around the world how should we respond my opinion and I'd love to hear your opinion before we end tonight my opinion is to go to that hadith of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam <coughs> he said about akhiru zaman he said if you have land hold on to your land you're familiar with that don't you and he said if you have animals hold on to your animals and then a man asks O Messenger of Allah what about if we have neither land nor animals he said sharpen your sword of course CNN is going to call him a terrorist now he said sharpen your sword because you're going to be dealing with chaos and anarchy and riots <coughs> as people seek to survive by fighting each other for food 
where can we get land and animals to sustain ourselves in this impending collapse? The answer is certainly not in the cities. If you believe that you can survive in the cities and get land and animals in the cities, <coughs> you should buy a one-way ticket to the moon. <laughs> and so Egypt, Egypt I'm talking to you tonight. In Pakistan I'm talking to you tonight. Listen to me and get out of the cities. 20 million people in a city, 15 million people in a city, who's going to feed them? Where are you going to get your food from? What's going to be the price of that food? Get out of the cities while still there is time. Go to the countryside. Go to where rain falls. Go to where there is water. And produce your own food. Dairy crops, food crops, dairy farming, milk and meat. So that you can survive the storm that is coming. Ensure there is water supply. Do not depend on oil for energy. Use natural energy. A bicycle is natural energy. Wind, solar energy, water energy. Number two, live in small communities. Because small communities can more easily sustain themselves without having to depend on, be dependent on supplies and f or food from outside the communities. We now return to Pakistan. An attack on Iran can be launched simultaneously with an attack on Pakistan. The purpose would be to eliminate Pakistan from the nuclear club. But we've been saying this for 10 years now. When the attack on America took place in September 2001, we produced a booklet two months later, a Muslim response to the attack on America that booklet is on my website and in that booklet we said that those who planned and executed 9-11 had as their ultimate target Pakistan and they put the blame on Afghanistan so that they could put their troops in Afghanistan so that they would be advantageously located for moving in on the final target, which is Pakistan. Why Pakistan? Why is Pakistan so important? The answer is Pakistan is a member of the nuclear club. It is the only Muslim country which possesses nuclear weapons. And according to the Bible of the Zionists, no Muslim country must be able to defend itself. <laughs> The Zionist Bible says that no Muslim country must have nuclear weapons. But the Zionist Bible says Israel can have as many nuclear weapons as it wants. And Israel should be able to also use its nuclear weapons according to their moral law. And because Pakistan has nuclear weapons, Pakistan has to be denuclearized. Their strategy for denuclearizing Pakistan appeared to me 10 years ago to be to try to so destabilize Pakistan that there may be civil war in Pakistan and then use that civil war as an excuse that we have to save the world from a nuclear holocaust. 
we have to save the world from nuclear weapons landing in the hands of terrorists and so we have a mission <laughs> for the sake of mankind we have to attack and invade Pakistan and destroy the nuclear plants in Pakistan and de uh, destroy the nuclear weapons in Pakistan and also break up Pakistan into bits and pieces so it can never rise again when that happens of course we must have a Zionist friend to take over and control all the pieces and it is time for Muslims around the world to recognize including Muslims in Iran that Israel's most strategic partner most strategic ally in the world today after the United States is India with Saudi Arabia neck and neck behind India and so not only must India be involved in the attack but also when the attack takes place on Pakistan and if it succeeds then in the sequel it is India who must now control the region on Israel's behalf an attack on Pakistan a successful attack on Pakistan and the denuclearization of Pakistan and the breakup of Pakistan into bits and pieces will impact upon Muslims in the whole of that subcontinent in such a way as to bring about a state of demoralization and despair and send shock waves to Muslims in the rest of the world that one of the largest in Muslim communities around the world in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh have now under, come under the foot of Hindu India so India will rule the entire South Asia with NATO in control in Afghanistan what should Pakistan do at a time like this this late hour perhaps it's already too late for Pakistan to do anything because those who are controlled Pakistan politically and those who have been in control of the Pakistan armed forces have distinguished themselves with their stupidity and I have to use a harsh language I'm so sorry to use this harsh language against them their awesome and monstrous stupidity these last 10 years since 9-11 in supporting war on terror which is a euphemism for war on Islam <coughs> supporting NATO in the attack on Afghanistan your innocent Muslim brothers in Afghanistan and you supporting NATO killing innocent people but more than that handing over the territory of Pakistan to the Zionists have you no shame this is what you did for 10 years that all the NATO supplies going to Afghanistan went to the territory of Pakistan and it took you 10 years to stop it only when NATO killed 23 Pakistani soldiers they didn't by accident they launched an attack on the Pakistani post while he was sleeping to send a message to you that that's it the friendship is over we're coming to attack you now so only when that happened now you're going to stop them from transiting the territory of Pakistan with supplies for the NATO troops in Afghanistan how could you be so stupid to hand over three military bases in Pakistan to the United States so that drones could go and from above pilotless drones and killing our people innocently and now 
when this, that knife is about to cut your throat only now, you're waking up. When the attack on Pakistan takes place, I think they already know what's going to happen. So all of these Pakistani Zionists, I call them Zionists, already, probably already have their suitcases packed. Like they did it in Saigon. And they'll all be flying to Miami and to Los Angeles and to New York to spend the rest of their miserable lives. These traitors. But I'm not talking about them tonight. I'm talking about the Pakistani people, as poor as they may be. In their poverty, they still love Islam. And they hate, they hate the government of the United States, which has been committing aggression and oppression <coughs> with deception after deception. Feelings in Pakistan have reached fever pitch. They know in Pakistan the attack is coming. My advice tonight to them, if it is not too late, I don't know. What can you do? My answer is, if you are to win Allah's help, you got to put your house in order. You got to abandon those who are fighting over sectarian issues. Stay away from them. Get away from these people. Deobandi versus Brelvi. <laughs> uh -huh. This sect against that sect. Treat these people as though they are a people who have to be cast aside don't keep their company and try to bring again once again bring the fraternity of Islam that these are all brothers and sisters in Islam one people identify yourself as a Muslim I am the student of Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah he established the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies in Karachi, Pakistan. And that's where I studied under him. And because of what he taught me, and the methodology of study that he gave to me, I'm able to do the work that I'm doing now. So you might want to go to his grave in North Nazimabad in Pakistan, Block B. Go to his grave and offer dua. This is halal, this is permissible. To offer dua that Allah might forgive him his sins and grant him nur in his grave and grant him <coughs> Jannah. Ameen. Mawlana Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah never joined in the sectarian warfare in Pakistan. Never. And he established the Alimi Institute as a non-sectarian institute. He was not Deobandi and the institute was not Deobandi. He was not Brelvi and the institute was not Brelvi. Let me repeat that to those who are now controlling the institute. Where I studied and where I was once the principal. He established an institute which was neither Deobandi, nor Brelvi, nor Ahli Hadith, nor Wahhabi. It was Muslim. And he said himself, I am not Deobandi, I am not Brelvi, I am not Ahli Hadith, I am not Wahhabi, I am Muslim. That's his statement. And that's the way out for Pakistan today. To get out of this cancer of sectarian warfare. Number two, Allah made riba haram. Pakistan is miserably poor today because of riba. The paper that you're using as money in Pakistan, the rupee, is bogus, it's fraudulent, it's utterly haram, and it's a vehicle of riba. 
Your ulama in Pakistan have not been able to recognize that all these years? Go look for those scholars of Islam in Pakistan who can recognize that paper to be bogus and fraudulent and haram. Who can recognize so-called Islamic banking to be delivering riba through the back door. Who can recognize that membership in the United Nations organization and submission to the Charter of the UN is a recipe to slavery. Who can recognize that membership in the International Monetary Fund, which prohibits the use of gold as money, is a recipe for slavery. Look for such scholars of Islam and follow them. And also for the people of Pakistan, get out of the cities, go to the countryside and seek to produce your own food to sustain yourselves in the tomorrow that is coming that's going to be horrible. Let us now turn to implications for the United States of America. As soon as Israel attacks Iran, and my opinion is that Israel is not going to attempt to deliver a knockout blow. Israel will attack Iran in order to commence wars that she hopes will follow one after the other. As soon as Israel attacks Iran, the first implication is that Iran is going to attack Iraq. And Iran is strategically poised, advantageously poised, to attack the United States in Iraq. As soon as Iran is attacked, Shias around the world are going to respond with solidarity with Iran. And that includes the majority population of Iraq, which is Shia. What about the Sunni in Iraq? The Sunnis are waging a war against the United States. They want to get the United States out of Iraq. And if Iran attacks Iraq, the Sunnis are going to also intensify their attacks on the United States. And so the United States is going to be in a no-win situation in Iraq. You'll be facing enemies fighting you on all sides with no friends around you. None. I don't think, and I hope and pray, I don't think that NATO will succeed in getting the Turkish government to act so stupidly to attack Iran. I don't think it's going to happen. No. And let us pray that the Turkish government is not ruled by fools. And so NATO and the United States in particular are going to be faced with war in Iraq that they cannot win. And they can lose. They can lose. And this is what Israel wants. This is what Israel wants. But there's another battlefront I want to turn to now. And this is where we need our military analysts. I wish we had some here tonight. That Iran is also likely to attack Bahrain. And it should not be difficult for Iran to take Bahrain. Bahrain cannot stand up to an attack from Iran. Bahrain is just across the water from Iran. I am suggesting to you that Iran is going to attack and take Bahrain. And if and, if and when Iran attacks and takes Bahrain, 
Then there's a causeway between Bahrain and Saudi Arabia where you can drive back and forth. <coughs> the road will be clear to Saudi Arabia. I am anticipating and the Saudis probably already have their plans laid out very well because they know what's going to happen and Israel already knows what's going to happen that they're then going to turn to the United States to invoke whatever secret agreements they have of defense that the United States has to intervene in Saudi Arabia to protect Saudi Arabia from an attack from Iran I think the Zionists in the US Congress <coughs> will ensure even though the US armed forces would not want to go in there even though the Barak administration would not want to go into Saudi Arabia the Zionists in the US Congress will ensure that American forces will have to enter into Saudi Arabia to face Iran I'm also suspecting that they might do the same thing with Pakistan to force the Pakistani political leadership and military leadership to follow some secret agreement they probably already have to bring Pakistani troops into Saudi Arabia to face Iran if that happens number one consequence will be the United States will be facing two fronts where they're going to lose the war the first front will be Iraq and the second front will be Saudi Arabia and Pakistan will be facing defeat in Saudi Arabia and civil war in Pakistan in order to save the United States from defeat Israel will have to intervene and so history will repeat itself for those who have been reading Jerusalem in the Quran in order for the passage from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana to take place, you remember? the first world war had to take place and in the first world war the Germans brought in their submarines and Britain the island was marooned surrounded by German submarines and, the, and Britain would have lost the war and at that critical moment the Zionists then brought the United States into the war despite the efforts of men like uh, Henry Ford and when the United States entered into the war then Britain was saved from defeat but the consequence of that was that Britain was no longer the ruling state in the world and the transfer of power from Britain to the United States was well on the way as a consequence of that first world war so I am suggesting to you that the planning that is now taking place is a repeat of what happened then that they are setting a trap for the United States so that the United States is going to be led to a situation where it's going to be facing defeat in Iraq and in Saudi Arabia these are my opinions, you don't have to accept them and only one power in that region could intervene to save the United States from defeat and that is Israel and that would be the bell being rung <laughs> that this is the passage of power now from Pax Americana to Pax Judaica this is the Islamic eschatological dimension to the analysis that a day which is like a month will now be coming to an end 
and a day which is like a week according to the hadith will now be beginning the Protestant version of Islam which is the Salafi version insists that somewhere on earth somewhere on earth we just have to search maybe somewhere behind Greenland you're going to find a place on earth where a day which could, a day will be like a year so my answer is well keep on searching <laughs> keep on searching and I'm not speaking scornfully that's not my way I am not speaking in any derogative way disrespectful way that is not my style no I have the right to say however this is your methodology so keep on searching <coughs> we have interpreted the text differently this is our interpretation and we have insisted time and again that no one should accept our interpretation unless and until you are convinced that it is correct we said a day like a year is a different dimension of space and time than the one in which we live and so to a day like a month and so to a day like a week but Dajjal is here on earth but you can't see him only when a day which is like a week comes to an end after Israel has ruled the world for a day which is like a week only then would Dajjal appear in our world as a human being as a young man, powerfully bit, curly hair and so on, to rule the world from Jerusalem. And so our Islamic eschatological analysis is that the United States is being led with a controlled demolition of the US dollar. Not happening by accident. A controlled demolition of the US economy is not happening by accident. And a trap being set for the United States militarily so that the United States will no longer can no longer be recognized as the ruling state in the world and Israel can replace them. I want to end now by turning to two actors and we thank Allah that he created both Gog and Magog. If he had created Gog alone we would have been in a lot of trouble now. But he created both Gog and Magog and he gave both the Gog and Magog the power that none can fight them except Allah himself so if Gog and Magog turn against each other they'll destroy each other wouldn't they? if you do not understand the subject I have a book at the back entitled An Islamic View of Gog and Magog in the Modern World and again as usual the Salafis are rejecting that book <coughs> Imran Hussein is misguided. I think that for Russia and for China, an Israeli attack on Iran, particularly if it involves the use of nuclear weapons, would be recognized as a threshold being crossed that so long as you did not cross that threshold Russia and China were prepared to go along and continue in the Security Council of the United Nations for example cooperating and collaborating where possible in managing the affairs of the world but once you cross that threshold the implication for Russia and China is that you have crossed the point of no return and that an attack on Iran is now going to inevitably lead to world war that after Iran and after Pakistan and after the Arabs 
the Zionists are going to turn on China and Russia to make sure that China and Russia also bend down their knees and accept Israel so that Israel can become the ruling state in the world. No Jew is going to accept Dajjal as the Messiah if Israel has not established its dominion over the whole world. <laughs> no Jew will accept the Jal as the Messiah when he comes. If Israel at that time has not established its political and economic dominion over the world, and that includes Russia and China, and so Russia and China would know today it's them, tomorrow it's us. And they're not going to wait until tomorrow to recognize that. The minute Iran is attacked, they will recognize that the threshold has been crossed and that they are now moving inevitably towards nuclear war. Russia and China acted strangely on Libya. You remember? When the vote came to the Security Council, they abstained, knowing full well that if they abstain, the resolution will be carried, and that is the end of Gaddafi, and end of the Libyan government. Why did they do that? I have asked the question. I have an answer, but I can be wrong. I felt that perhaps they knew what the plan was and they wanted to let the Western world, NATO, to sink deeper and deeper into a quagmire, you know, like shifting sands, you can't get up. So eventually they will end up in the graveyard and only then will, need, will Russia and China attack them. How are Russia and China responding to Syria at the moment? How will China, Russia and China respond to an attack on Iran and on Pakistan? My understanding is that Russia and China are going to be quite different in the way they have beha behaved so far in international affairs. Quite different once the attack on Iran takes place. And so we will be heading ultimately towards world war. A world war which the Quran has anticipated when Allah spoke about Gog and Magog and when he said in Surah Al-Kahf وَتَرَكْنَا بَعَدَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَمُوجُ فِي which can mean one of the possible meanings is that on that day Gog and Magog are going to clash with each other. If Gog and Magog clash with each other in nuclear war, with thousands of nuclear weapons being used, what will be the consequence for the world? Let me end with Surah Al-Isra, the ayah or the verse of Surah Al-Isra, in which Allah says, بَعْدَ أُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَإِن مِّن قَرْيَةٍ إِلَّا نَحْنُ مُهْلِكُوهَا قَبْلَ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ أَوْ مُعَذِّبُوهَا عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا كَانَ ذَلِكَ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَسْتُورًا And not a single town or city will escape. They'll all be destroyed. And those which escape destruction will be punished with terrible punishment. And all of this is inscribed in the book. This brings an end to our preliminary analysis of the implications of an Israeli attack on Iran. We have certainly not exhausted the subject and it is likely that we'll have to come back to the subject in a second and a third lecture but I do believe that we have done sufficiently tonight to provoke you now to think on the subject 
And I'll be very happy to hear your views and your responses. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiul alim wa tawa alayna ya maulana innaka anta tawab rahim. Bi rahmatika ya arham rahimin. Amin. The question is, how do I view the response of the Pakistan armed forces now when the curtain <laughs> is about to be drawn? And NATO has already sent, by Federal Express, they sent a message to Pakistan. We're coming for you now. That's the message when they killed the soldiers. Huh? We're coming for you now. And now, <laughs> now the Pakistan armed forces, because now, of course, it's too late to do anything else. They say, okay, we'll not allow NATO to transit Pakistan. And we're going we're going to take back this base that we gave you. So you could kill the people in Afghanistan. <laughs> and you have 15 days to vacate the base. No, I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed. I think a lot of the generals have tickets to Miami. <laughs> because they know that they're going to be lynched. I hope they're listening to me. Because the Pakistani people love Islam. And the Pakistani people are very, very angry with those who have betrayed them. And betrayed Pakistan and betrayed the Ummah. Flying first class to Washington. Anytime Washington calls them for consultation. So I'm not impressed at all. A people who have betrayed Allah and His Messenger. And now at the last moment, now you're trying to save face. I'm not impressed. But the overwhelming majority of the soldiers in the Pakistan armed forces love Islam. And they're going to fight as faithful and courageous Muslims. That I have no doubt about. It is the command which stinks. It is the command, the political and military command that I call Zionists. And they're on their way out as soon as Pakistan, as soon as Pakistan is attacked. They're finished. They're going to fly to Miami. And leave Pakistan to the true Pakistanis. <laughs> so I'm not impressed. The Muslims in India, of course, are going to be in a much worse situation once Pakistan is attacked. The Muslims in Bangladesh are going to be in a worse, most, more, uh, a worse situation because of the attack on their morale. They will be demoralized, demoralized. And it is a function of Islamic scholars to deliver guidance and leadership. And the scholars of Islam are fighting each other over popcorn. <laughs> fighting with each other over popcorn. And attacking me because I declare myself to be a Muslim. Who? He's only a Muslim? He's neither fish nor fowl? <laughs> Who is he? He has no Akida? That's now the attack on me. Yeah. Well, let them continue with the attacks. Go ahead. Um, the question is whether the world is going to come to an end, Armageddon, the war of all wars, which will destroy most of humanity. Is it going to take place next year, 2012? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I believe that 2012 will witness the commencement of a series of wars, one after the other. And Singapore knows that very well. <laughs> and these series of wars, once they are commenced, they're not going to stop until Israel replaces the United States as a ruling state in the world. I do not anticipate the clash of Gog and Magog, meaning the Russian-led alliance against the American-led alliance, which will destroy every town and city. I do not expect that clash to take place immediately, maybe another 20 years or so, but I can be wrong. Any more questions? I am not certain. 
that when Israel attacks Iran, that they're going to use nuclear weapons. I expect the use of limited nuclear weapons on certain specific sites in order to destroy nuclear plants, hmm? underground nuclear plants and some. But I hardly think that Israel is going to use tactical nuclear weapons in populated areas. Hmm? The uh, public opinion around the world, the backlash of public opinion would be too great. The Hadith he has asked about that Dajjal will be followed by 70,000 Jews from Isfahan wearing their Persian shawls. Um, and he says that there are now about 30,000 Jews in Iran. Part of the strategy adopted by Gog and Magog has been to accept the religion. The Khaza, for example, accepted Judaism. And so the world witnessed for the first time the unique phenomenon of something called a European Jew. Prior to this, the only Jews that there were in the world were Semitic Jews, Semites. <laughs> The Europeans are not Semites. But when the Khaza accepted Judaism, this is a historical fact, they accepted Judaism, the European Jews came into being. And we, and the Quran accepts as a Jew whoever claims to be a Jew. You may not be an Israelite, you may not be an Israelite, but if you declare yourself to be a Jew, then we accept you as a Jew. And so when the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that you're going to fight the Jews, and you're going to defeat them, and at that time the stones and the trees will speak, and they will say, there's a Muslim, Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. He's not referring to any Israelite Jew alone referring to all Jews, European Jews as well as Israelite Jews. 40,000 Jews from Isfahan, therefore, could be Jews both Israelite and non-Israelite. Hmm? Um, sometimes, 70,000, sorry. Sometimes when the Hadith uses a figure, it uses it figuratively. figuratively uh, what, I um, can't get the pronunciation. As a figure of speech. For example, a man asked the Prophet which is the first masjid which was built. He said the Kaaba. And then he asked which was the second masjid which was built. He said Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. And then he asked how much time elapsed between the two. He said 40 years. 40 years for a few thousand years? 40 years for a few thousand years between this one and that one? How could it be 40 years? So sometimes the Hadith will use a number as a figure of speech. It does not therefore have to be understood literally. <coughs> one of the reasons for the attack on Iran, this question now allows me to expand my analysis, is because the Zionists want to get rid of the present government in Iran. You can choose to believe what you want. But I accept that the present government of Iran is sincere in its opposition to Israel and its support of the Palestinians. You can choose to believe what you want, that's your business. This is my opinion. My view is that one of the reasons for the attack on Iran would be to bring about regime change in Iran. The present regime in Iran is not a militantly Shia regime waging Shia Sunni sectarian war. No. The present regime in Iran 
is willing to establish fraternal ties with Sunnis. Yes, they do not permit any Sunni masjid to be established in Iran. So Sunnis in Iran do not have Salatul Juma, they have to go to the masjid under the Shia control. And that of course is something we don't agree with. But that's not a cause for taking up guns and fighting them. No. <laughs> So I understand that the government in Iran at this time is a government which is prepared to try to establish Shia-Sunni solidarity. This is my view. And this is something inimical to Zionist interests. The Zionists would like to, to direct the Shia world in a direction of confrontation with Sunnis. And for that, you need to have regime change in Iran. And if they succeed in that regime change by attacking Iran, they will want a new regime to emerge in Iran, which will be militantly sectarian and facilitate the emergence of a civil war between Shia and Sunni. At that time, at that time, if this succeeds, then I believe we'll see the fulfillment of this hadith about Dajjal being followed by 70,000 Jews from Isfahan wearing their Persian shorts. Any more questions? The question pertains to the use of gold and silver as money and the utility of buying gold and silver this time when the gold stocks of the world are controlled by those who are not Muslims and that by, going, by buying gold you are enriching non-Muslims. Um, I have a book at the back entitled The Gold Dinar and Silver Dirham, Islam and the Future of Money. Uh, whether we like it or whether we don't, the world tomorrow, in my opinion, is going to return to gold and silver as money <laughs> whether you like it or whether you don't I came to this conclusion about two years ago perhaps because of my study of Islamic eschatology that no Jew will accept the Jal as the Messiah none if Israel is using paper money because every Jew knows what the ulama don't know in Islam. Every Jew knows what the muftis don't know in Islam. Every Jew knows that this paper is bogus, it's fraudulent, it's utterly haram. <laughs> every Jew knows that. And it's a vehicle through which mankind is ripped off of their wealth. They all know it. It's only our scholars don't know it. Don't know it. In order for Dajjal to convince the Jews that he is indeed the true Messiah, He's going to have to bring back the money which the temple in Jerusalem used to mint. The temple built by Suleiman minted its own gold and silver coins. Because the Roman government minted coins with graven images and this was not kosher, not halal. To put a human head on the coin. And people had to go to the temple with their Roman coins and you had to pay the rabbis for services like making zabiha of animals, to sacrifice an animal. Only the rabbi could do it in the temple. How would you pay? Because this money is not halal with a graven image. So there were money changers in the temple who would change Roman money to temple money. And the money changers were ripping off the people. And when Nabi Isa alayhi salam entered the temple and he saw that, he cursed them. Because that's a form of riba. And he overturned their tables. And he chased them out of the temple. And he said, you've taken the house of God and transformed it into a den of thieves. So every Jew knows that the temple minted its own coins, gold and silver. 
And so Israel has to return to gold and silver as money. And therefore the Zionist world has to return to gold and silver as money. And when they do, guess what the world of Islam will do? The muftis are going to wake up. And they're going to say, yes, 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 this is halal money. Yes, 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 we should have dinar and dirham. I have prayed to Allah to beg him to take me away from the world. I don't want to live to see that day. Because the shame and the disgrace will be too great for me. The shame and the disgrace as a Muslim for me will be too great. On that day, when they have brought back dinar and dirham as money, and only then do our people wake up. But I also pray to Allah for something else, to keep all those muftis and all those scholars alive on that day. <laughs> keep them alive, even if you have to bring them on a stretcher, keep them alive. <laughs> So that they will witness the shame and disgrace on that day. Those who today, up to this day, they are not prepared to say that this paper money is bogus, it's fraudulent, it's utterly haram. Keep them alive to that day. So whether we like it or whether we don't, gold and silver is coming back as money. Secondly, if I am correct, that this paper is bogus and fraudulent and haram. You read my book at the back, The Gold Dinar and Silver Dirham, Islam and the Future of Money, and listen to my lectures <coughs> on the subject Islam and the International Monetary System. If I'm correct, then every transaction involving the use of this paper is haram. Every transaction. So you pay your zakat, it won't be accepted. You give charity, it won't be accepted. You have nikah and you give the dowry, it won't be accepted. You use this to perform your hajj, it won't be accepted. Every transaction will be haram. Well then what do you do? You have to return to halal money. Halal money is first and foremost dinar and dirham. In the event that dinar and dirham are in short supply in a market, then halal money would be commodities of food consumption, which are in abundant supply in the market, which have a shelf life, and which has intrinsic value created by Allah Himself. Any more questions? The Prophet said <coughs> that the time will come when you'll not be able to find a single person in all of mankind who will not be consuming riba. Are you aware of this? The Prophet said, alayhi salatu waslam, that the time will come when you'll not be able to find a single person in all of mankind who will not be consuming riba. And whoever declares that he is not consuming riba, verily the dust of riba would be upon him. Verily the vapor of riba would reach him. So it is not possible for us to escape completely. But in Surah Al-Taghabun of the Quran, Allah says, Ittaqullaha mastata'atum. Fear Allah to the extent that you have capacity to do so. What we are doing is advising and also preparing the way to establish communities. I have here in this audience students of mine who are working on it even as I speak, right here in Malaysia, to build communities in the countryside, Muslim villages, which will use dinar and dirham for, as money for buying and selling. And in those communities, you will not use the paper money. At least, this is an effort to respond. If you have a better way, tell us, show it to us. We are not 
convinced that you can do this in downtown KLCC. <coughs> we are on the contrary convinced that you can do it in the countryside. And once you make that effort, then Allah can help you. Okay? So, even when you build such a community in the countryside, and 90% of all your transactions are halal, you will still have to market your produce. People who are coming from outside to buy, or you buying things from outside. There will still be interaction with the outside world. And that interaction will be involving electronic money. Tomorrow paper will be gone. Okay? So let us agree on this position. That we are obliged to make the best effort. Any more questions? The question is about the euro and the fact that the euro is in trouble. Before the euro was created, put together, <laughs> you had individual currencies in Europe. Okay? And you still have them, but they are now linked together. If the euro collapses, then they, you return to what you had before. The German mark by itself, the Italian lira by itself, the sterling pound by itself, the French franc by, uh, existing by themselves, separate from each other. We just go back to where you were before. But in the same way that we, the world is witnessing a, con witnessing a controlled demolition of the US dollar, so too it's not far-fetched <coughs> for us to recognize that the same thing is happening to the euro. That this is international banking at work, okay, reorganizing the world in such a way that electronic money will replace paper money and the banking system will take control of the money system in the world. Governments will no longer have control over money. Banking system will have control over money. The euro cannot stand in the way and therefore there is this demolition. The US dollar cannot stand in the way and therefore there is this demolition. One thing concerning gold that I forgot to mention. Do you know there is a hadith about Akhiru Zaman or the last age? It is there in my book entitled uh, One Jamaat, One Amir which is out of, uh, out of print at the moment. But that book is on my website, you can read it. The hadith is there that in the last stage, in Akhiru Zaman, the earth will vomit from its liver columns of gold and silver. Hmm? So they may have control over the gold stocks of the world today. But Allah can cause more gold to emerge. Any more questions? No more questions? Uh, as soon as we have the last question, then we can have some tetaric, okay? <laughs> yeah, right. What advice do I have for teenagers? <laughs> he said that the John will be a young man. A young man. And I said based on that hadith that tomorrow the young people are going to rule the world. Today when I buy some I don't know whether you've ever heard the word it's a word that is very strange in my vocabulary I never heard it before ten years ago something called top up. <laughs> top up. Yeah. Top up. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> when I buy this strange thing called top up, <laughs> I have to ask the fellow to put in the money for me. Because I don't know how to do it. And I'm really not interested in learning how to do it. <laughs> if you send me, if you make the mistake of sending me a text message, you wait a couple of years to get a reply. <laughs> Because I don't know how to send text messages and I don't want to learn to make text I do not want to learn. 
I have enough misery in my life answering a hundred emails every day. Why should I make my life more miserable? Uh, with text messages. The young people are the ones who are going to be technologically literate. And all the people will behave the way I'm behaving. So young people are going to rule the world and run the world tomorrow. As the world becomes more technologically interlinked. So young people have a strategic role to play in the world which is now coming into being. Because at that stage of youth it is easier for them to learn, to learn these things of technology. But uh, Surah Al-Kaf of the Quran has delivered to us a very important guideline. And that is that the ones who will show the greatest understanding of the job, the quickest understanding of the job, and the ones who will disp display the best backbone. You know they had backbones made out of iron and steel? And you know they also backbones made out of recycled paper? You know that? So the ones who are going to demonstrate the greatest backbone for resisting the oppressor, the oppressor, are the young ones. This is in Surah Al-Kaf of the Quran, the story of the young men in the cave. Hmm? And this has been my experience, that the ones who show the greatest resistance to my message that I deliver are the elders. And the ones who are flocking to me and longing to learn from me and insisting they're going to come to Malaysia, they're going to come to KL, whether I like it or not, they're coming to study with me. Are the young ones. Some of them 15 years of age, 16, 17 years of age. And they're going to be listening to this lecture. And they show sharpness of understanding. And the parents are opposing them. Mm -hmm. And so, I believe being young, and if your heart is not corrupted with pornography, which is around the corner, being young, and if you do not corrupt yourselves in uh, sexual promiscuity, and destroy your inner light. Being young and your heart being guided in the right path, then tomorrow for you there is a glorious day ahead because you are the ones who are going to take the flag. <laughs> you are the ones who are going to carry the flag of Islam tomorrow. And that's what the story of young men in the cave. Do please read my book, Surah al -Kaf and the modern age. Last question. I can't remember when last I used the word Taliban. <laughs> no. I refer to the authentic Islamic resistance. The authentic Islamic resistance, resisting oppression in Afghanistan, resisting oppression and occupation in Iraq. What do I think of them? They are the ones who tomorrow are going to lead the army. They are the ones who are going to open the way for the army which is going to march straight to Jerusalem. This is the only armed resistance in the world of Islam with a guarantee of success by the Hadith. Guarantee of success. And we must support that armed resistance in Afghanistan and in Iraq in whatever way we can with our tongue with our pockets in whatever way we can alright that's enough for tonight uh, Wednesday night at the Tanaga International University Tanaga National no no, no. Tanaga National at the Tanaga National University in Bangi, 
in Bangi at the same time 8 o'clock and the topic is Islam, the United Nations and the New World Order and then on Saturday the last one at UIE in Gombak uh, on the coming financial crash it's a seminar with um, Dr. Mira and myself taking to the whole of the Saturday morning Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa taba alina ya mawlana inna ka anta tawab rahim Allahumma anta salamu minka salam tabarak ta rabbana wa ta'ali tayyadha al-jalali wal ikram Allahumma alina al-haqqa haqqa wa ruzukna al-tiba'a wa alina al-batila batila wa ruzukna al-shtinaba Allahumma alina al-ashya'a kamahi اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فعفو إن يا كريم اللهم إن نعوذ بك من عذاب القبر ومن عذاب النار ونعوذ بك من فتنة المحيا والممات ومن فتنة المسيح الدجال وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وعلى أصحابه أجمعين برحمةك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين Ilahi nastulil firdausi ala Wala aqwa ala naril jahim Allah fahab li tawbata wa ufir Dhunubi fa inna ka Ampunan kepadaku, ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa-dosa besar Tuhanku, aku tidak layak untuk syurgamu Tetapi aku tidak pula sanggup Dari itu kurniakanlah Ampunan kepadaku Ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya Engkau lah pengampun Dosa-dosa besar Ilahilas tulil firdausi Allah fahabir